Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Sowing Seeds. My name is Simone Jordan, and I'm a third year medical student at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Sowing Seeds. My name is Simone Jordan, and I'm a third year medical student at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Sowing Seeds. My name is Simone Jordan, and I'm a third year medical student at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. Good evening, everyone. So sorry for the interruption. We're having a little bit of technical issues, but um, I just wanted to introduce this program. This is Sowing Seeds and it's going to So be sorry for the interruption. We're having a little bit of technical issues, but um, I just wanted to introduce this program. This is Sowing Seeds and it's going to So sorry for the interruption. We're having a little bit of technical issues, but um, I just wanted to introduce this. Um, hi, I'm sorry. My name is Mont Daniel Nancho, um, second year. Um, we are having a little bit of technical difficulties. Hi, I'm um, sorry. My name is Mont Daniel Nancho, um, second year. Um, we are having a little bit of technical difficulties. Hi, I'm um, sorry. My name is Mont Daniel Nancho, um, second year. Um, we are having a little bit of technical difficulties. Jesus. Hello, everyone. My name is Simone Jordan, and I'm a third year medical student at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. This is going to be a program. Hello, everyone. My name is Simone Jordan, and I'm a third year medical student at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. This is going to be a program. Hello, everyone. My name is Simone Jordan, and I'm a third year medical student at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. This is going to be a program. Hello, everyone. My name is Simone Jordan, and I'm a third year medical student at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. Hi, Dr. Jefferson, if you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and how you ended up in otolaryngology. Hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, my name is Gina Jefferson. I am a head and neck um, surgical oncologist and I perform microvascular reconstruction. I came to the field of otolaryngology kind of as a, not as a straight arrow. 
I was an engineering major in undergrad. I pursued a master's of science in biomedical engineering. And then during that graduate school experience is when I determined that I actually wanted to become a physician. Um, so with my background of running track in college and doing engineering, biomedical specifically, I was interested in orthopedic surgery. Um, when I went to medical school, I still remained open-minded, but I was really focused on ortho, did several electives during my third year, and each time I just did not fall in love with the specialty as I had anticipated. So I ended up matching in general surgery. Um, I matched at Howard where um, even though there's not um, an otolaryngology program, there are subspecialists that included otolaryngology. So as a general surgery, PGY-1 and PGY-2, at Howard, I was exposed to otolaryngology for the experience of endocrine surgery. Um, but otolaryngologists obviously do more than thyroidectomy. And so I was exposed to a patient that underwent laryngectomy. And from that, I fell in love with ENT. I took a year off after my second year to um, do research at Charles Drew University in Los Angeles um, with their Department of Otolaryngology, applied, matched. Um, Charles Drew ended up closing. I completed my residency in ENT at Loma Linda, and then I pursued fellowship training for head and neck oncologic surgery and microvascular reconstruction at the University of Mississippi. I think Simone asked in our email to include what we love most about otolaryngology. Um, what I love most, actually two things, actually many things, but one of them is because our specialty is in the head and neck and so subspecialized, we have a frequent opportunity to work with other specialists such as neurosurgeons, um, in the operating room itself. And it just makes for a fun atmosphere in obviously helping our patients. I think the other thing that is very impactful and what makes me love our specialty is the fact that all of the disorders that we um, treat and manage ultimately impact how a person interacts with the world, whether it's through hearing, whether it's through their appearance because they have a big tumor, um, we are really impacting someone's quality of life. Um, and uh, I think that obviously we take that seriously, um, but it just makes you feel um, that much more appreciated and um, makes you really focus and remind yourself every day of why it is you entered medicine in general. Anything else, Simone? Anything else, Simone? No, thank you so much, Dr. Jefferson. We're going to add the next panelist in. Hello, Dr. Brown. If you could give us a little bit of information about why you selected ENT, your background and your training. Hello, and Dr. Brown. If you could give us a little bit of information about why you selected you ENT, like your background and your training. Hello, Dr. Brown. Thank you very much, Simone. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone tonight. Uh, I'm a pediatric otolaryngologist at Michigan Medicine, and I also have the honor of serving as the Associate Dean and Associate Vice President for Health Equity and Inclusion at Michigan Medicine. Um, I am uh, grew up in the inner city of New Jersey, so I was a first generation, low income uh, from a low income family. Uh, so first one of my family go to college, and I went to Brown and then Harvard for medical school. Uh, and um, like um, Dr. Um, uh, Jefferson said earlier, you know, I actually initially thought I was going to, uh, interested in orthopedic surgery because I'm an amateur musician and use my hands a lot. And so my first uh, kind of exploration in medical school was in orthopedics. And my first three publications are in hand surgery and I stumbled upon some famous study about glenoid version that people still use. Um, but then I realized that wasn't the field for me. Uh, and so I 
had some um, black uh, mentors who were a few years ahead of me at Harvard uh, who were thinking about otolaryngology. And so uh, I explored the field more and I also had some interest in um, hearing loss. I took a sign language course in college and I also realized I could use my uh, personal interest in music as far as hearing and, and voice in, in this field. Um, and so um, I chose otolaryngology after I did a rotation and realized that I liked the diversity of the um, of the procedures from very simple and taking 30 seconds to put in ear tubes to very complex, uh, like uh, doing head and neck cancer, like uh, Dr. Jefferson. Um, and a lot of the things are quality of life. And so when we help people hear for the first time or hear or restore their hearing, or we re help them swallow better, or we help them smell better, or we help them, you know, restore their speaking. These are all things that make um, uh, us really happy. You know, I happen to take care of only kids now. And what makes me happy about that is that we're changing their trajectories in life uh, so that they can be productive. Um, another question that was asked is like, you know, do we, did I have mentors in the field? And absolutely. Unfortunately, when I was coming through uh, the field, there weren't many black faculty mentors, but there were a lot of residents. And when I trained at Michigan, about 25% of the residents were black and they became my mentorship group. However, when I was in, in medical school, you know, I you had to choose mentors who didn't look like us. Uh, however, I did find some amazing mentors at Harvard who were not only mentors, but sponsors and went out on a limb and, limb and made sure that I got interviews at Michigan and other top programs. Um, and I'm greatly uh, appreciative of them. So thank you. And I look forward to other questions uh, that anyone has. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. And then our next panelist is going to be Dr. Cameron Watts. And Dr. Watts, if you could just leave, give me a little bit of information about Thank your Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. Brown. And then our school. next panelist is going to be Dr. Um, Cameron Watts. What made you so And Dr. Watts, if you could just leave, also, give me a little bit of information about your training. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. Brown. And then our next panelist is going Good evening, everyone. And thank you for the invitation. I am a... Um, clinician scientist or surgeon scientist. I have a PhD in physiology. Um, I went to the University of Maryland, did the MD-PhD program there, and um, I did primarily a microvascular fellowship. But when I got my first grant at the University of Texas, I transitioned out of that. So I mainly do head neck oncology, and I have a basic science research lab where we are interested in understanding how tumor microenvironment stem cells and cancer-associated fibroblasts contribute to poor outcomes in head and neck cancer, um, the role of targeting the cell population specifically to improve chemotherapy and radiation response. And we recently had some pilot work funded in the arena of racial disparities, looking at specifically biologic drivers that may underlie um, changes we see with respect to overall survival with Black patients. Um, with HPV, oral pharynx cancer compared to white patients, as well as in general, um, the poor outcomes that black patients with HPV negative squamous cell carcinoma have compared to all other um, self-identified racial groups. I recently took on a new role in the Duke Cancer Institute um, as the Associate Director for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. And in that role, we working um, on impacting workforce decisions and retention and succession planning across all the departments that interface with the Cancer Institute, from the clinical departments to the basic science departments. Um, what I love most about otolaryngology really is the opportunity to take care of a wide variety of patients. I really enjoy asking questions at the bench that directly impact the patients that I take care of in the clinic and in the operating room. I really like the camaraderie. That's probably one of my favorite things. So I get to participate on panels like this with one of my uh, best friends. I just got out of the operating room with another dear friend. So the opportunity to take care of patients with people um, that I admire and respect um, is really a joy of the work. With respect to mentorship, I'd say my greatest um, level of mentorship 
Um, it was not within the field of otolaryngology, but my research mentor, who is um, a world famous gastroenterologist, it goes to show you, you do not necessarily have to find mentors that are in your exact field. Um, Dr. Powell has really been helping my career. I, I tr tribute my success thus far to date to the relationship that we have. And, um, and he has just been instrumental in helping me develop as a scientist. Um, and so I guess that's kind of would wrap up. Uh, my my path was not straight and narrow. So in the times I, I get nervous about talking about how I got here because I didn't come here by any direct means. Um, I had no grand plans, even though I spent eight and a half years, nine years in graduate school and medical school. Um, but it goes to show you that with good training, you can transition into really whatever um, you may want to do with your career. To really... Thank whatever you, so um, you may want to do um, with your career. Our next panelist is going to be Dr. Faison, who's going to join us from the University really, of Michigan. Thank whatever you, so um, you may want to um, do with Hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is Shannon Faison. I'm a fifth year resident at the University of Michigan, originally from Columbus, Ohio, born and raised there. And I went to DePaul University um, uh, in Greencastle, Indiana, majored in biochemistry. No, I wanted to be a doctor from pretty early on in my life. Um, but I got pregnant my senior year of college and delivered a baby boy who's now 11 years old. His name is Aiden. And I got to, I went to medical school at Ohio State. That was through the MedPath post, post baccalaureate program. And that's a program where you do a year's worth of graduate level coursework, retake your MCAT and matriculate into medical school if you complete that successfully. And my introduction to otolaryngology was during my first year of medical school, there was a curriculum called Career Exploration Week, uh, where different specialties come to give presentations and otolaryngology was on the surgical subspecialty day. And I remember sitting in the front row, the little hairs on the back of my neck, standing up, hearing about the breadth and depth of otolaryngology um, and seeing kind of all of the amazing surgeries, the fellowship opportunities uh, that were available. And I remember looking at the slideshow and not seeing any anyone who looked like me. And so immediately after the lecture, I went to Google and looked up black otolaryngologist in Columbus, Ohio, and I found Minka Schofield, and she was a general otolaryngologist at Ohio State. And so I connected with her, started shadowing in her clinic and in the operating room, and we created a life, a really long mentorship uh, relationship that was very beneficial. I also met uh, Dr. David Brown uh, during medical school as well when I rotated at the University of Michigan for my away rotation. And I just, again, loved the breadth and depth and all of the unique skill sets and surgical skills that be gaining and operating in the neck is my favorite anatomy of all time and uh, operating around delicate cranial nerves and total laryngectomy is still my favorite surgery with bilateral necks. <laughs> and so I understand that Dr. Jefferson having seen that surgery is literally my favorite. And, you know, speaking to mentorship, you know, without Mika Schofield or David Brown, I'm not sure I'd be here you know, really addressing my confidence, imposter syndrome, you know, giving me the skills and the strategies to be a successful student and now clinician has been so beneficial. And I've always been looking forward to carrying that forward in the way I mentor medical students. Always been looking forward to carrying that forward so in the much. way I mentor last medical but not students. Least we're going to have Dr. Jackson, who's a resident from Vanderbilt University. Always been. Hi, everyone. I'm Jared Jackson. I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, um, went to Howard University for undergrad and then went to Howard University College of Medicine for medical school. Um, in terms of how I got into the field of ENT, um, so growing up probably around in my high school years, I shadowed um, a family friend, Dr. Neil Beckford, who's an otolaryngologist in Memphis. He did he went to medical school at Howard and then did his residency training at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, so I kind of in, in high school and college, I would shadow him during my breaks. Um, and so going into medical school, I already had a little bit of, um, kind of basic knowledge to the field of otolaryngology and, um, was kind of primed a little bit to, you know, already understand about the specialty a little bit and got to see it firsthand, both in the OR and in, and in the clinic. Um, so I wasn't dead set on it going into medical school, but I did have a, a really good I'd say knowledge base kind of of what the field entailed. Um, 
that I was able to build on once I was in med school. And so after um, kind of being in anatomy lab first year, um, really enjoyed kind of the head and neck region. Um, and then towards my second year, I did a little, little bit more shadowing at Howard. Um, I think all of that together kind of made me feel like I was making the right choice in terms of picking a specialty. So I probably decided um, fully at the end of my second year, kind of going into my third year, that this is what I wanted to do. Um, uh, in terms of other mentors that I've had um, at Howard, we don't have a otolaryngology residency program, but we do have um, uh, two attendings. One of them is Dr. Kalaja. She's uh, did her residency. She went to Howard for med school and then did her residency at Georgetown. Uh, she's general ENT, so she sees a wide range of things within the hospital and um, takes care of all the uh, ENT or otolaryngology um, patients that are there. Um, so she was a really great mentor for me. Um, I was the only uh, student applying for my class, which in a way was helpful because I got a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with her, um, both shadowing in the clinic and in the OR, which was helpful. Um, and then Dr. Earl Harley uh, at Georgetown, he's a pediatric, pediatric otolaryngologist at Georgetown who um, also went to medical school at Howard, uh, was really instrumental in terms of kind of getting me hooked up with their program and allowing me to um, use their program as um, basically a pseudo home program in a sense. And um, I did an away rotation there. And so he was really instrumental in me in terms of meeting um, other people in the field and kind of um, getting my foot in the door, I'd say. Uh, and now I'm at uh, Vanderbilt first year, I'm an intern. Um, and uh, I think what, what one of the, some of the things that I like about the specialty um, have already been mentioned, but I love the kind of wide range of procedures that are available, whether it be um, in-office procedures um, from as simple as, you know, cleaning ears, which is a lot of what I'm doing as an intern to, um, you know, the more complex procedures like Dr. Faison talked about with total laryngectomies, bilateral neck dissections. Um, you know, it's a really wide range of procedures that are available both in office and in the OR that are really, really cool and interesting. Um, and then um, working with other specialties has been previously mentioned, but I think that uh, can't be understated, you know, whether it be pituitary tumors and working with um, neurosurgery um, or uh, facial fractures that may be extended to the orbital floor. So you're working with uh, opto, um, endocrine, surgical oncology, you know, there's a uh, real positive spirit of collaboration that I think is um, really, really positive, And I think is overall really, really beneficial for um, uh, you as a, as a clinician. So um, great specialty and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much everybody for your introductions. Um, I guess the first question that I have for you all is for those of you who have served on uh, Thank you so much everybody for your introduction on selection committees. Um, for I guess the first question that I have for you all is for those of you who have served on Thank you so much everybody. For I think I can answer that. I am the um, associate program director at um, the University of Mississippi. Um, one of the things or, or probably the thing that everyone looks for is just a strong, um, well-rounded applicant. Um, so not someone that just has high scores on an exam or has straight A's um, 4.0 GPA. Um, as many of you know, the USMLE has moved to not having a number score um, for step one. Um, this year it's pass fail, and obviously that will contribute to a focus by residency programs on other aspects of an application. Um, in the past, uh, and the reason why um, the USMLE has moved in this direction is because many programs um, notoriously just look at a score first and foremost, throw out a bunch of applications, and then review the others. Um, I think um, for otolaryngology, that might pose a problem in the transition in terms of how, um, you know, for the select number of spots that we have available across the country, how it is we go about weeding out the applicants because the number of applicants um, regularly outnumber the available spots. Um, so that leads you as the medical student interested in otolaryngology um, in a conundrum. You really have to focus on um, developing your CV early on. And it is okay if you begin 
um, looking at one subspecialty area and transition into another. That's the whole purpose of medical school to explore and make sure that you are um, identifying the specialty that you will excel at. And that is largely in part because you love that specialty area. Um, but that should lead you to um, really doing shadowing experiences that some of the um, residents have already discussed in their um, preparation um, and how they have um, actually acquired mentorship along the way. Um, also the engagement in research activities. When I say engagement in research activities, it's not just a spot on your CV that I worked in Dr. Watt's lab. Um, you really should have a focus on having something tangible from the experience um, that you can actually put on your CV, whether it was a poster presentation, abstract that was accepted, whether it was an oral presentation or manuscript. Um, I think that you should focus on even preparing manuscripts, even when your research experience um, produced results that were not what you anticipated. All of these things lead you to uh, what Dr. Watts alluded to earlier. Your research informs um, how you address patients clinically and vice versa. So all of these things are kind of the foundation of a well-rounded person. Also, we want to know, is the applicant a team player? Has the applicant any leadership um, experience? So team players, oftentimes we look for pe people who have been involved in um, organized sports, for example, um, leadership, um, organizing events within the, their church community, um, local community, helping others. Um, there's so many things that people often don't consider um, in their experiences that actually fall into these categories and they fail to put them on their um, CVs. I think these are things that you all should really think um, holistically about and talk to your friends, family, um, those that you um, consider counselors from school um, to really identify those other um, characteristics and activities that um, really impact your application. I can also chime in as well. I now serve on the selection committee in Michigan, and I, when I worked at Johns Hopkins, I was the associate uh, program director. And like um, Dr. Jefferson talked about, one of the first things we look for is a team player. And especially if you're doing a rotation with us, you know, your ability to function on the team and be hardworking and to be seen by other residents as someone that uh, they want to work with, that means a lot. So we actually go to our residents and ask, who, who performed well during a rotation and who did not? So if they say, this person is an absolute no, we will not interview them because we, we know that they're going to have to work closely with the residents. And the residents said this was like the best, we're definitely going to interview that person. Other things, we, we have behavioral-based interview questions. Um, and um, uh, so you should expect that at a lot of programs. So look those up and be prepared because those who don't know where behavioral-based interview questions can be thrown off. We, some of the things we look for in those questions are team player, integrity, leadership, not just being a member, but leading, uh, you're having, being a hard worker, being resourceful, being dependable. Um, um, these are things that we look for in our residents um, so that uh, we can best take care of our patients and be able to trust you in the learning process. We realize that um, uh, there are people who have challenges in their lives. We all have challenges in our lives. Uh, and what I look for is we want to know what, uh, if you have challenges, how do you over, if you talk about them, how did you overcome them? What did you learn? And how are you better? Sometimes when we see personal statements that this list adversity after adversity after adversity, I'm seeing a pattern and I'm wondering, okay, when they come to my program, are they still going to have adversity? And so uh, be careful as you talk about your, your obstacles, change them into how you've grown uh, instead of just listing them because you don't want to scare people off that, oh, they may have trouble when they're here. We want to show that, wow, this person can get back up and, and be stronger than um, before. We do a holistic review as well, which includes like clinical grades and 
um, we actually find that the clinical, your clinical grades are the best predictor of how you're going to do as a resident, not your step one or step two scores. Um, but we do look at if you pass step one these days and, you know, if your step two score, we factor that in, but we don't have a cutoff. We look at every application. Uh, and it, like uh, Dr. Jefferson said, your research, not only have you done research, you need to be able to explain it. If you can't really tell us what happened, why you studied it, what the outcomes were, then we then we feel that you did you weren't really a part of it, you know. Uh, so being an active participant in your research as you're going through it, really understanding, ask those difficult questions to your research mentor because that's when you um, uh, have the opportunity to clarify things, not when you're interviewing. Know your stuff. And the more you know your stuff and the more you show that your willingness to learn and be curious, we get excited about that, you know? Um, uh, sometimes, uh, oftentimes we look at people's life story. Everyone has a different life story. Uh, and some of them are very interesting. It's like, wow, I wanna get to know that person more, okay? Uh, and then we want letters that show that you're hardworking, you're smart, you're curious, you're trainable, that you, know, uh, you may be able to do surgery. So we're looking at the whole package um, and at least at our institution, once you get an interview, you're on equal footing with everyone else and how you perform that day determines a lot about your next steps. So thank you for that question. Although I've sat on uh, the applicant process every year that I have been a faculty member. Um, I don't have anything additional I'd add just echo the sentiments that were said, especially the piece about being able to articulate your research because we will make a note of that. Thank you so much. Can you guys tell me what made you specifically pick your subspecialty in otolaryngology? I guess I can start. Um, I'm again a fifth year resident at the University of Michigan, an incoming pediatric otolaryngologist at the University of Cincinnati next year. And I picked pediatrics because I just love children. I love the, the spontaneity throughout the day, a kid wanting a hug or smiling, um, but also just the impact on their lives just from a simple surgery such as uh, tympanostomy tubes um, and, you know, doing tonsillectomies to improve sleep apnea. And with pediatrics, you're really a generalist. You do all of the subspecialties. And so I couldn't just pick one. I really liked head oncology. Again, total laryngectomy, Vilonex is my favorite surgery, but I also liked sinus surgery. I do like to do ear surgery. I loved airway surgery, airway reconstruction for pediatrics. And so for me, it was maintaining all of those skills and um, using or just operating and interacting with the patient population that made me the happiest. Um, and that's how I chose pediatrics. Congratulations, Shannon. Um, I chose head and neck and microvascular reconstruction. I think I alluded earlier to the fact that I just fell in love with laryngectomy while I was a general surgery resident. Um, but what I love most about head and neck, as opposed to the other subspecialties of otolaryngology, um, is the long-term relationship I maintain with my head and neck cancer patients. Um, after you are diagnosed and treated for cancer, you still maintain a relationship with your oncologist for five years. And then at that five-year mark, you're considered cancer-free and cured. Um, and so I just think shepherding a patient through that entire process, patient and their family, um, and um, living the highs and lows, more so the highs. I love celebrating anniversaries. Um, I just love the entire aspect from surgery to the end. Obviously that's countered by, you know, not everyone does well um, with respect to their outcome. They can have cancer come back. They can have cancer never even completely go away. Um, and obviously people can die from their disease, but I just think the um, relationships that are built in that entire process are profound, memorable for me, 
um, impact how I interact with others outside of medicine. Um, and I love the surgery, obviously. I love um, getting rid of cancer, but more um, so my love is actually putting people back together, helping to restore form and function. And I think the function and quality of life is what makes all of us just go into otolaryngology in the first place. I'll go as well. So I'm also a pediatric otolaryngologist and, you know, I love taking care of kids. I think kids are, you know, innocent with a lot of things that they, uh, that afflict them. And so, you know, they didn't drink or smoke to get their disease and they have a whole life ahead of uh, them. And, you know, unlike Dr. Jefferson, the vast majority of my patients, I don't see forever. And actually I like it. I like the fact that, you know, if we, uh, put ear tubes in them and they were able to hear and they got better or we took out their tonsils, they were able to sleep better. Great, you know, and their lives went on. And then in 20 years, they forget that they even had those surgeries or that I did them. So it makes uh, uh, a huge difference. Um, I also like the variety in my subspecialty. And I also like the fact that in pediatric oncology, you do a little bit of what all the adults do, but you do them on kids. So we do some head and neck, not the same types of head and neck tumors. We do ear surgery, sinus surgery, some facial plastics, you know, uh, a little bit of everything. And that variety is just so exciting. Uh, again, one of the reasons why I was interested in otolaryngology, because we did some of the very simple and quick procedures to the big procedures. And I still get to do all of that in pediatric otolaryngology. I guess I can answer this from a different perspective since I don't actually do the work that I did a fellowship for. So life's also about the choices that you make. Um, and I was given an opportunity to start a research lab and had to make some difficult decisions. I consider myself the queen of reinvention. So I ended up, I did a primary microvascular fellowship, which also means I was in the OR with head and neck surgeons every day, but I was not doing the ablation. Uh, and after I decided that I couldn't run a basic science research lab and be an effective microvascular surgeon, I had to pivot. Uh, and so I do a lot of head and neck, but at Texas that also I did sleep. I started the ultrasounds, uh, FNA, uh, program there and, um, and then developed more head and neck skills. So I, um, I never, ever have a problem asking for help. So if I get a complicated head and neck cancer patient that comes in, some of it I don't do. I immediately send to my partners, but of others I do want to do. Um, I learned how to do an infrastructure maxillectomy last week. I'll do my own next week. Uh, the nice thing about having 12 plus years under your belt is you really just have to see it one time, but you also can, are mature enough to know that this isn't, you know, something that I should be doing by myself and, or, you know, the really big wax I pass off to my partners. Um, and then one of the nice things about being in the lab and having a lot of flexibility is when the cases pile up and they're piling up, all of us are having a shortage for OR time with COVID understaffing is I'll go in and I'll do, you know, the neck dissection while the team is doing a free flap in another room because, you know, we can only all be in one place at one time. So I, I loan my skills out that way to my partners as well. And I'm not more of an RVU person, which is, you know, how we get measure our, our workforce productivity. So, you know, they, they take care of the patients. I'll come in do a part. I don't need the points. I go back to my lab. Um, and so that's kind of how I've pivoted multiple times in the last 12 years as a faculty member. Hi, everybody. I'm just going to hop on here real quick. Um, we are having a little bit of technical difficulties, but I want to be able to get the audience questions in. My name is Amara. I work with Alumni Affairs with Daniel, and we put on sewing seats. So the first question from our audience tonight is from Isaac Solomon, and he asks, I would love to hear any recommendations for couples matching while applying to ENT. Also curious about how best to balance a healthy personal life while in residency. So any one of you guys can jump in and ask, answer that question. Love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, maybe I could help. Um, I did a couples match, but I have some friends who did. I think regardless of your specialty, 
when you are planning on doing a couples match, the biggest thing you can do is from um, both sides, reach out to programs of interest that you have in common uh, early on and try to get your foot in the door um, and really kind of hit the ground running um, with a lot of force and uh, proactiveness in terms of um, trying to make sure that these programs are aware of the decision that you're making and your partner, what, um, whatever specialty that they're going into, make sure that the program is aware uh, pretty early on. Um, and then I think also kind of having having kind of like a backup plan in, in a sense. I think couples mm-hmm. matching can be tough sometimes, especially if um, one or both of the uh, specialties are pretty competitive. You know, you always want to give yourself um, a nice backup plan that you can fall back on if things don't work out. Um, I believe with the couples matching, you can do however many like algorithms or matches. And then also there's like a way where you can set the algorithm. So like some person, one person can still get a match if the other person doesn't, something like that. Um, uh, So, you know, just making sure you know the ins and outs of how the system works and reaching out to the different programs early on, um, I think would be in your favor. Um, And in terms of a healthy personal life, I think um, the biggest thing is, you know, you just have to find the time for what you are passionate about, whether that be, um, you know, working out or um, going to the movies, going out with your friends, you know, whatever it is that you do to kind of de-stress. I think you have to prioritize that in the in the free time that you get, because you'll the free time that you get is is what you get. And you're not going to. You know, you got to be in the hospital when you have to be in the hospital. So the time when you're off, you know, finding ways to, you know, a lot specific amounts of time for, you know, like I'm going to work out this this day, this weekend, you know, whatever it is, um, just kind of trying to put yourself first in that way. And it's not always going to work, you know, um, sometimes you'd be like, I'm just going to go to sleep, you know, <laughs> but, you know, doing the best you can to, you know, put yourself first and also having, um, you know, people around you or family or, you know, people that you can call that in case you're in a, uh, tough spot or, you know, trying to prevent yourself from getting into a tough spot as well. Okay. So it sounds like definitely plan ahead if you want to be able to couples match appropriately and also to have a backup plan. And then for the second part, it sounds like you need to do defensive calendaring. So being able to make sure you have what you know need, that you need to replenish yourself on the calendar ahead of time so you do not mix it out. So that's what I heard. I'll be taking notes well out there, guys. <laughs> well said. I would also add for the for the couples match, like I was watching this from afar. So the best thing you can do is probably reach out to people who recently couples match. Right. They would know the specifics. Um, I don't have like the specifics in my head, but they would know like the ins and outs and recommendations on what to do. That's what I would recommend. Yeah, sounds great. And so we do have another question from Terry Smith. Along with the clinical portion of my practice in the future, I want to focus on preclinical basic science medical education. And I was wondering if any of you have experience with what that would look like. As the scientist, um, I'm not sure what basic science medical education is. Is that teaching in those courses, like in, in the first year of medical school? Um, I know that a lot of times they will just ask, especially in anatomy, if there are instructors within the specialty that want to come over and give those lectures. Um, if you have an expertise in a particular area in the basic sciences, uh, they are always looking for educators, um, folks to give a real world, um, lecture. I, I, I've given a few lectures to the first year medical students when I was at mm-hmm. the university of Texas. And um, one of the things they love is when you have the clinical pictures to go along with the anatomy, it really gets them, um, gets the students jazzed up. So you probably, my best advice would be you'd have to figure out the medical school that you're partnering with and then share with your expertise. And if you're volunteering, they're going to love it. I would second that. I'm first year. I just came back from Sim Lab. So I do love when the pictures are the clinical pictures are relevant to the, the book work we're learning, so that was great. Uh, our next question is directed to you, Dr. Brown, and it asks, you mentioned the representation of Black physicians at the University of Michigan. 
how would you advise finding mentors at a university that may not have as much black representation? And I'll also add a little caveat to that as well. Like, how would you find uh, mentors at an institution that might not have ENT? How do you go about doing that? Yeah. So uh, it's a great question. Um, there are lots of opportunities. Uh, all of us on this, you know, sowing seeds uh, are, can be mentors for you. Uh, we have lots of opportunities in otolaryngology. We have a uh, Society, Society of University Otolaryngologists, and there's a diversity liaison uh, at every uh, residency program. We have uh, the diversity committee through the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. We have mm -hmm. the Harry Barnes Society, which is the Black Society of the Otolaryngologists, and we, we sponsor um, events at our academy meeting every year and we bring black uh, perspective otolaryngologists. Dr. Faison uh, started um, the Black Oto Network uh, during the pandemic and there's Zooms and we have uh, online and one-on-one -on -one mentorship with individuals. So we realize that some people might be isolated in their own institutions, yeah. but there's mm -hmm. a strong network of black otolaryngologists all over and we learned through zoom that we can be connected electronically yeah. and so that is helpful additionally you do need some people um close by and so even if there's not a black otolaryngologist there may like um like our another speaker said earlier you find a a, a person uh, in any field you know who understands what you're going through uh, what challenges you might be having uh, and, and what the isolation is and how to build community at your institution. It could be other interns, it could be other faculty members, other residents. Don't be afraid to reach out because I think some of the worst things you can do as a, as a trainee is to live in isolation. When you reach out, other people would appreciate it and love it. Uh, they may be busy, but that community gives them life. Yes. Oh, that was wonderful. So it sounds like be able to connect to different societies. And there's a lot out there who actually do want to connect with young and up and coming ENTs, especially black, those in the black and the BIPOC population. So sounds like you do have an opportunity out there, Jordan. So I'll definitely take notes of that. We have a banner going across telling you what societies that Dr. Brown was just talking about. So I would write that down. We do have another question. We have a lot of questions tonight. So hopefully we can get through all of them from Bianca Parker. And she asks, what are ways otolaryngologists can make a difference amongst the Black patient population? I can take that question. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are opportunities for advocacy throughout otolaryngology. At Michigan, we have a free clinic that we host every three months. It's called Hope Clinic. It actually was started by Lamont Jones. He's Dr. Lamont Jones. He is at Henry Ford, a facial plastic surgeon, uh, where we offer free care to the community um, for children in the realm of pediatrics. There can be ear, like hearing screenings that are taken out to the community, head and neck cancer, education events. Um, and so in every subspecialty of otolaryngology, there are ways to go to the communities that may not have access to care, that may um, not have access to fresh fruits and vegetables and may not know the education and things uh, in ways that they can prevent disease or cancer or whatever it may be. And so I think that's what's great about laryngology and that is a field that, um, that, or I guess an area that we can tap into that true advocacy and improving access to care. Uh, I know that's a, a passion of mine as well. Yeah, so it sounds like it's, um, we can get involved on like a local level, more on a nuclear level and tapping into folks who also have that passion like you and, and, and being the agent of change. And what that looks like is actually putting your, getting your hands dirty and doing that. So definitely we can make a difference amongst the black patient population. And also looking at it from the perspective of it doesn't have to just be otolaryngologists. Like what, what are the social determinants of health around surrounding your population that will prevent them from coming to the hospital and actually meeting ENT. So thinking about it from a different lens is really helpful. We have another question from Victor. And then it says, for those of us who may have found otolaryngology a little later in our medical journey, what advice would you have for us to make up for the lost time? I think we see 
non straight arrows. I guess you are referred to as bent arrows um, more <laughs> frequently than you probably imagine. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of it has to do with your passion and just how hard it is you are willing to work and increase your CV, increase your exposure to um, really otolaryngologists who can mm -hmm. advocate for you and really um, help you with your transition and match into otolaryngology. Um, that takes a lot of um, outgoing um, personality, really. You have to overcome right. whatever reservations you might have about approaching someone like David Brown, <laughs> for example. Um, you really just need to reach out to these people, ask them um, if they're going to be at whatever meeting you're going to. Can they introduce you to so-and-so at such and such a program because you're interested in that program? Um, you need to make yourself known, basically, is the bottom line. And you really need to um, focus. And I think a lot of people, um, people that have come to me for advice who have, were interested in orthopedic surgery, for example, prior to finding their love of our specialty, um, <laughs> they have accomplishments of manuscripts, presentations, sure. and ortho. Um, you really have to own those bring them to fruition again so that you've at least been productive in your research efforts even though you're not pursuing that specialty mm -hmm. um, so don't just engage in research and not do it full throttle obviously the research activity helps you determine your true interest for that specialty but once you've started something we like to see on whatever specialty um, and you are actually applying to that you've brought something through fruition that goes back to being dependable that goes back to being someone that has interest in learning because medicine after all is a lifelong learning journey yeah it sounds like for even those bent arrows there's still hope and i think based on what i gathered from what you said is that even if you're doing research in a different area you you were doing something in that time so you're going to take those transferable skills and apply it to this to the field of otolaryngology. So it's not totally lost, but it's about how you frame the skills you've learned in that area and be like, hey, I can do that and I can be useful in, in your program. Yeah, sounds sounds about right to me. <laughs> okay. One more thing to that, I would yes. just, um, with the caveat, really get good um, counseling because um, you want to be realistic. Yes. So can you can you like dive deep into the, what that might mean? What does it mean to be realistic in that sense? I think someone coming to the game um, late, as the question um, mm -hmm. stated, without any um, CV accolades, without anything on their CV, it's going to be hard to pursue any surgical subspecialty, whether it's otolaryngology, ortho, neurosurgery. Um, so coming to something late with nothing to back up your application is going to be a problem. So that's why early on in medical school, even though you have no idea oftentimes what it is you want to pursue, you should still be engaged in meaningful activities. Obviously, it's going to enrich your life and helping you figure out what it is you want to do, but it will also augment your CV in the, in the end. Got it. Sounds perfect. Thank you for that clarification. We do have another question along those, uh, kind of along those lines, but talking about um, step two score and how to get that prepared. So due to the timing of my research, year ending and my sub I schedule, I simply won't have a step two score before the interview invites are released. Is that going to significantly reduce how many programs consider my application? And this is a question from Quinton. Maybe I could answer that. I think it depends on a few things. One being how badly you need the step two score to perhaps show an improvement from step one. Um, I My step one score was average and my step two score. So it was important for me to make sure that my step two score was on my application. And I did a lot better on my step two score, um, which I wanted to be shown so that I could talk about it and show that I did like um, had a really significant jump. But if you did really well on step one, you may not even need, may not even want the step two score to be on your application 
um, one program see it. I know that's the way that some people who did really well on step one kind of kind of go. They they honestly wait until the interviews and stuff is passed, and then and then they do it then. So I think it kind of depends on you and kind of where you where you fall within that um, uh, within that range. Um, and then additionally, now that there's no that the step one is pass fail, I think. Well, I guess your step one would not have been pass fail. So this one would have But in general, um, in terms of the step two score, I think for me, like I said, for me, I can only speak to me. It was helpful for me to have it on my application just because I know personally I wanted to show that I was capable of making a significant jump. Um, and it was something that came up in my interviews. They were like, oh, no, you did you did really well on, on step two. Like, tell me a little bit about what you did differently or, um, you know, what uh, you feel like was the difference. And, you know, that's a segue for me to be able to talk about, you know, overcoming some of that adversity like Dr. Brown mentioned earlier. So that was kind of my approach. But since yours won't be there, I don't, I think, it, I don't want to, it's, it's hard to say without knowing kind of where, where you are and what your application is. But um, I suspect that as we kind of continue down the line, step two will begin to matter more. Mm -hmm. And um, it would be probably beneficial to have it on your application. But for you, it's hard to say. I'd recommend like reaching out to maybe a mentor you have or, um, you know, one of us one on one and kind of seeing what your application looks like and whether or not you can, I think you can always like send like a notification later to different programs. Like if you get it back and it's mm -hmm. what you want and you can send an update to maybe your the top places that you want or um, there are ways, you know, to kind of um, work around it. So I would recommend like reaching out to a mentor and kind of, or one of us and, and figuring that out personally one-on-one. -on -one. So for a different permutation, if, if, uh, since step one is pass fail and they were not able to take step two before training their ERAS application, how would that change? Um, I guess the answer you give, I get, it would be talk to a mentor, but. Yeah, I, I, I would assume mm -hmm. that, I'm not sure how, I would assume it would be harder to like push step two back now that step one mm -hmm. doesn't have a numerical score. I would think that it sure. may, it may be they, you may have to have it on your application earlier, but I don't know. I'm not sure how it, how it works now. Um, maybe some of the, yeah, Dr. Brown. Yeah, can I chime in? And so yeah. part of the answer is that we don't know. <laughs> this is the first year that we're going through. But one thing that we do know is that otolaryngology is participating in signaling. You need to take that seriously and, uh, and use your signals wisely. The, um, you're more likely to get an interview at a place that you signal, which means that you're interested in going there, um, mm -hmm. than if you don't. Uh, and so uh, this is, going forward, the game is going to be more about where you signal and, and about your board scores as well, but your signaling is really going to help you get interviews. So you have seven signals in otolaryngology this year. Other fields are doing different things. Some fields are having like 20 or 18 and they're having like gold and silver signals. Um, like I think orthopedics is having like 20 or 30. And my suspicion that if you have 30 signals, if you don't signal someone, you are probably not gonna get an interview there. And so we, we, so we may, there, there's gonna be a lot going on. So pay attention uh, at each year to what the signaling process is and what the signaling strategy is because it's gonna depend on the number of signals you have. You need to keep in close contact with your advisors and the, uh, the organization of program directors puts on a, a, se a seminar every year for the applicants to teach them about signaling. So pay the close attention to that. Yeah, if I can uh, add something, I, I, just in terms of the signaling, I would agree with Dr. Brown 100%. I think the year before me, it was five. My year was four, so I didn't even know it was it was seven now. So I had four signals. So I had to, you know, you had to really be strategic in terms of like, do I send it to all the top places, but then risk like not giving myself or, you know, not having like, not a backup, there's no backup in ET, but like, you know, maybe places where I feel like I may have a better shot to kind of like secure it up or do I want to just send them out to all my kind of reach program? You know, you have to, have to be strategic about that. But I did get interviews at three out of the four places that I signal. And uh, some of those mm -hmm. places directly asked me, they're like, oh, like we saw that you signaled us. Like, what? why did you signal us like in the interview? So that to me told me that if had I not signaled them, I, I may not have got an interview. Well, it's mm -hmm. hard to say, but I think the fact that I did signal them was a direct 
directly led to me getting the interview because they brought it up in my interview process. So be strategic about that. Now that you have seven, you have, you know, a little bit more wiggle room to, um, uh, you know, really show the programs that you're interested in, kind of put your best foot forward. So I would just wanted to agree or kind of second that. Yeah. So signaling is key. I would write that down and, and being able to talk to a mentor who can directly look at your case as well and give you specific advice would be great. And if you guys are up for it, can we just do one more question before we close out? Uh, I think this one's an important one from Nina Rochelle. What advice would you give a student who has, who has what some, might have consider a red flag on their application, failure of exam, took a leave of absence, et cetera, who are interested in ENT? Again, that entails the need to really have an honest conversation with yourself and um, obviously find someone that is in the know of um, otolaryngology application process so that you can really get good, um, solid advice and develop a strategic plan for moving forward. Obviously, there's many permutations to this, as Dr. Jackson has alluded to with the previous question. Um, but there are several things that you can do um, in between, um, say, your PGY two year versus um, after matching processes happen. You can take a, a research year and really be productive with it. Doesn't have to be at your own institution, can be elsewhere. There are several programs that have um, a year, a year following PGY, not PGY4, your fourth year of medical school, if you have not matched, um, where you can do um, kind of a clinical um, hybrid with research um, and really get more mentoring. Um, depending on the applicant, someone might advise you to actually do a preliminary year in general surgery. It, there's so many different factors with this question. Um, I just think it takes a lot of thoughtful um, consideration and discussion with a trusted um, faculty advisor to really make a decision that's going to be helpful to you. I agree, Dr. Yes. Jefferson. I think away rotations, I also call them away auditions, mm -hmm. are really important uh, to show kind of who you are and how hard you can work. And I did an away rotation at University of Michigan, and that's where I matched. And I, when I say I worked hard, I worked hard. <laughs> I brung it. <laughs> and it's really important just to show who you are, because if you don't have the, the CV that would be considered competitive and you really believe and you've had that honest conversation with yourself and your mentor that you are still a strong student clinically, but this certain area of your application is weak, then it's a great opportunity to do an away audition and to show who you are, show how hard you can work so that you can be a valuable member of the team and a member that they need in their program and really show that you're an asset and not a liability. And so those are great opportunities and you should talk with your mentors and members of the Black Auto Network, Harry Barnes Society, before you go on these rotations, mm -hmm. just to talk about what are the key strategies to be successful, because there is a hidden curriculum. And to talk to those people who are in the field um, and know the hidden curriculum is really important. Um, and I know through the Black Auto Network, we mentor students uh, to talk about how to perform on an away rotation and usher them through the application process as well, because it's, it's not easy. And mm -hmm. if you're like me, I didn't have any doctors in my family. I was the first doctor. And so I don't know the hidden curriculum. And so I had to be taught that and had to have someone willing to uh, contribute and give to me in that way um, that was um, not judgmental, um, but to really show me in usher me through the process. For those in the audience who don't know the term hidden curriculum, do you mind giving us a really quick definition of what that is? Yeah, I think hidden curriculum is really a, a term that we use when there's expectations that aren't spoken. And yeah. I think as African-American applicants to a specialty that's very special, that it's very competitive and it's also um, lacks diversity in a way, I think it's important that we know the way to play the game. We know how to show up and show out in a way uh, that is respected um, and admired. Mm -hmm. She's dropping gems, y'all. So I would be taking notes right now and just signing up for that mentorship. 
So we have come to the end of our sowing seeds tonight, and I would like to end on all of you guys giving your one-liner words of wisdom to our audience just to prep us up and get us ready for applying, especially for our fourth years who are turning in that application. So definitely we can go around. If you guys have any one word or one-liners, like we'd love to hear it. For those applying this year, practice interviews, have mock interviews, participate in whatever mock interview that you can. There will be some interviews I can tell you for sure that will be in person again, and some places will be interviewing virtually again. So it's really important to really optimize how you interview in both formats um, and really get good feedback on um, just common answers to the common questions that we ask on the interview circuit. For those who are applying this year, there's some things I would let you know is to study up on the programs that you're applying to. It's almost like dating someone. You want to flatter them with the things that you love about them. Uh, and, and so uh, make sure you read up uh, on the people who don't kiss their butts, but you know, make sure that you read up on their research and, and, and make sure you know that you are really excited about this institution. And um, also, I would recommend to know yourself. I actually, when I applied to residency, wrote out a whole bunch of things that I wanted to remind myself, and I read it beforehand. And make sure what you say about yourself is consistent. Yes. What I, I a red flag raises <laughs> when there's some inconsistency in the application, and I'm like, mm, something's not right here. We can't move forward. So be consistent, know who you are, and don't talk about who you ain't. Okay. Um, I think I'd have two quick points. For those programs, um, Duke is an example, probably Michigan, um, Pittsburgh, and others that have seven-year programs. If you're not interested in the seven-year program, please don't apply to it. Um, we know that we can clearly tell who's interested and who's not interested in trying to just have their eggs in more than one basket. Um, and so it's just, it makes a lot of extra work for those of us reviewing all of those applications. And it just, if you're not able to really articulate a research um, vision or, or why it's a part of what you wanna do, and, and, and that includes global health. So we have a seven year applicant in global health. So I by no means mean basic science research only. Um, just make sure that's really a part of, of your career and why you want that and be able to articulate that. And then the other thing I would say is, you know, oftentimes, you know, kind of a joke that's that we say is I, I just can't imagine looking across at this person at three o'clock in the morning. Right. So that that's about the energy that you bring to the, the table. You know, we are in the operating room at three o'clock in the morning and, you know, you want to be there with somebody you want on your team and that energy kind of comes through and especially the Zoom, you can get, you know, that can be detrimental to some folks, but it is going to be the way of the world. Um, and so I would just say, make sure you, you, rep, you know, bring, bring the energy that you would want, you know, others to see about you. I think I would say just believe in yourself and know what excellence you bring to the table and know that you deserve a seat at the table. Yes. And I think residency is very challenging, uh, especially in otolaryngology residency, any surgical residency. And so just knowing that going in that you're going to work very hard, you're going to be very tired. And knowing this going in, I think it's easier to transition and to, to adopt, adapt to challenging situations. And so, you know, I think it's hard during the pandemic when you may not have had a chance to rotate at different institutions, but just know that residency is hard, but you have to take care of yourself. And Dr. Jackson mentioned, you know, still doing the things that you love before you got into residency or into medicine and not losing, uh, losing sight of those things that make you happy, but know that it's going to be hard. Um, there are going to be days where you don't have a great work-life balance. I don't even know if I believe in a work-life balance because something's going to take priority one day and it may be different the next and you just have to do what needs to get done. Um, but just know that, you know, if this is truly your purpose and it should fulfill you, even when it's hard. Um, but 
you know, I think otolaryngology is an amazing uh, specialty. And although it's hard, I still love what I do and I wake up fulfilled every day. Mm -hmm. And so you would only really reach that if you know you're kind of in the right, in the right specialty, in the right field. And so only you can answer that question. So work hard, believe in yourself and don't give up. Um, I would add, I think uh, a really important thing is to have mentors like at every level, um, mm -hmm. both, you know, starting from like a PGY an intern like me all the way up to full blown attendings. Um, as the year goes on, as the years go on, there's a lot of changes that happen to the application process. Like even me, I didn't even know that it was now seven signals. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So that every year there's there's new updates there are changes that are made that are made. And to have someone, especially like residents that are kind of close to the application process that kind of had their ear to the ground. Um, and then also attendings who have been, you know, doing this for a while, who know the ins and outs, have seen all different types of people come through their program, have interviewed all different types of people who have a really kind of uh, macro view on everything. Um, you know, having that whole perspective and range is really, really important, especially as you're, when you're applying the people that I talked to the most were current residents, you know, to get a feel for uh, the different programs. Cause like I said, I came from a place with no home program. So I was trying to figure out like, what's the, what's the T on all these different places? You know what I mean? It's hard to really know what the, what each place is about unless, you know, you can look at the rankings and stuff, but you don't really know anything about what the actual program is like. So even people like there are places that I interview that I, you know, I'm, I'm out in obviously at Vanderbilt, but there are places that I interview that I can, you know, help, um, give some perspective on or things that I've heard, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I think having mentors at every level, but especially when applying, you know, having residents that you can talk to to kind of run things, um, run different things by and, you know, practice your interviewing, going on a ways, you know, we could do a whole one of these, someone sees about a ways. Yes. Um, and, you know, it's kind of funny being on the other end and like observing away students. There are things that you notice or see and you're like, versus like things that you're like, oh, that was really, you know, that was really, really impressive, you know, mm -hmm. that I think it's hard to, you're so in your head as a fourth year, you know, in a sub I like trying to make sure you do everything right, that, you know, it's important to just kind of take a step back and get the whole picture, which I think talking to people who have done it before and are in where the place where you want to be can be helpful with. So just reach out to people. That was one of the things I did. I reached out to anyone. I don't care if you didn't email me back someone was going to email me back. So I'll, so I'm sending out emails to whoever. And I think it really helped me. I got some great letters that way. Um, I had a poster that I presented at Academy at Academy. I'm me, I'm trying to meet as many people as I can. Um, you know, so taking initiative, being proactive, I think will go a long way. Um, especially for like, if you don't have a home program or you found this late, um, you know, really making that proactive nature of yours shine through is really, really important. And I think you can tell, when you're interviewing people or when you're interacting with them uh, through a sub eye, the people that are really, really proactive and that are, you know, really trying to make this happen. So that would be my advice. Have mentors at each level and then just go get it if it's really what you want. Yes. And with that, we're going to close out sowing seeds tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again to our amazing panelists. We appreciate your support of the SMA. We could not have done this without you. For those of you in the audience, I encourage you all to follow our Instagram at SMA underscore official, on Twitter at SMA, and like us on Facebook. But most importantly, if you're not a national member, if you're not a national member, become one. Please visit the SMA.org to sign up and get connected. We do have more sowing seeds coming up in the future, and I'll put it up on the screen right now. We have uh, general surgery coming up September 7th. Uh, September 21st, we have dermatology. And September 28th, we have ob I encourage you all to continue to tune in to our sowing seeds. And with that, we thank you and we'll see you next time.